Welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, where you'll hear highly accomplished and fascinating guests talk about the challenges they've overcome and the winning mindsets that have led them to great success. And now your host, Dr. Bob. Hello, I'm Roger Hedgecock, and no, you have not made a mistake. This is Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. In fact, it's the final episode of a special three-part series in which I've been interviewing Dr. Bob and learning about the lessons that he's learned in his journey through life. Hello, Dr. Bob. Welcome back to your show. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Thank you for having me again. You know, we talked about uh, Cognex and the uh, incredible success that you've had uh, back in episode two of these uh, of this three-part series, and you started talking about how you started Cognex but I'd like to hear more. I mean, you're talking about something called machine vision, for instance, in that, in that monologue there. And I said, what is that? I'm happy to tell you, Roger. Machine vision has to do with creating a system and a system composed of a camera and software and hardware that take an image in and make sense out of the image. This is very different than what happens in a medical laboratory or a doctor's office where they take images, very careful images, of course, and then a radiologist or a radiological technician looks at those images and makes decisions. And those images, uh, they come from machines that process the images that make them somewhat simpler for the radiologist to understand. But those machines don't make decisions. Machine vision systems, also called artificial vision or smart cameras, actually take images, analyze them, and make decisions. And let me give you an example so it's very clear. And there are many such examples, of course. One example is when a car is coming down an assembly line, the body is a skeleton, and it's moving down. It stops at various stations to have value added, whether it's the wheels added or let's say they're going to add the windshield. So the, uh, the body comes down, stops in a robot, stops at a robot station, where a robot is going to reach out, pick up the windshield, and place it in the car. Well, the problem is, in fact, is that the windshield isn't exactly where the robot was told it should be, and the car isn't exactly where it should be, and it's virtually impossible to make them too, that accurate. So in the case of machine vision, our product, the Cognex Vision System, would be mounted on the arm of the robot, and then the robot swings over, and the camera in real time looks out at the factory floor, finds where that windshield is, even though they can be piled in random order, even though there were reflections in the factory, even though it's glass, which is hard to see, the vision system finds the right part of that windshield, tells the robot exactly where to pick it up, then moves over to the car and tells the, vi tells the robot exactly where the opening is so that it can put the, car, put the windshield in the right place. Now, most people realize there are robots assembling cars and they really look like robots. They don't look like humans, but they have arms. Well, virtually everything that you buy today, uh, Roger, other than clothing, is made in an automated fashion using assembly machines that are sometimes referred to as robotic machines or robots, but they don't look like robots. But nevertheless, everything you buy, if you have a cell, everybody has a cell phone, that cell phone was not touched by human hands. Every part that was put into that cell phone, including the case, including the buttons, were all put in by automation machines that picked up those parts and accurately put them in the right place. And most of the cell phones made in the world today use Cognex Vision in their assembly. But it's not just high-tech products, Roger, that need machine vision. If you've ever eaten Milano cookies from Pepperidge Farm, those are a sandwich. They're caught in, in the Pepperidge Farm language, that's called an assembly. There's a bottom, there's cream, and there's a top. Well, it's not grandmothers making these cookies in little ovens. You're shattering my illusions here. It's not. It, it might <laughs> taste as good as your grandmother's, yes. but your grandmother could never make hundreds of thousands of those a day. All identical. All, all perfectly identical. And if you get those Pepperidge Farm, and I'm not trying to promote Pepperidge Farm, but that's an example of a customer. The assembly is controlled by automation machines, and we control those machines. Now, that's what machine vision is. This is a very <clears throat> sophisticated thing. And here's, I'm, I'm going back to the beginning now, because you mm. told me that you had three people when you founded Cognex yeah. in a rough yeah. neighborhood of Boston 
And somehow or other, you're now in 40 offices around the world with 2,000 employees. And you never went to business school. Good thing I didn't. Uh, because I would learn it couldn't be done. <laughs> how did it happen? All right, I'm going to give you some highlights of, of how that happens. And there are two aspects. One is, how does it happen? How does the product grow from a simple product that can read barcodes or position things? How does it grow to be able to support factories around the world with about $14 billion of revenue, not the 30000 of the first product that we sold? Right. So there's the evolution of the product, and then there's the evolution of the company itself. How does a company grow from three people to 20, 30, 40,000 people or thousands of people? So I'll deal with the product first since we just talked about the product. The first product was called Data Man, and it still is, and it's responsible now for about $500 million of business a year. And that product has the ability to read numbers, letters, barcodes, two-dimensional codes, all the codes that you see at, all, at lightning speeds. And it is the preferred barcode reader for logistics, such as uh, in, in major retailers such as Amazon, Walmart, Target. Well, here's how it happened. We could read numbers. And we were known in, in 1981 as a company, a small company that had a vision system that could read numbers. And I looked for other opportunities outside factories, and I found, oh, it turns out every product that is on, a, on the shelf in a drugstore, every generic medicine without a prescription, has a label on it, of course, and has a code number printed on it telling you when it was filled and where it was filled, which is very important for recall purposes. So I contacted these companies, and one of them was Johnson & Johnson, which was very concerned because I think they made Tylenol at the time, or whoever made Tylenol, we contacted them. And as you remember, there was a Tylenol scare because somebody had poisoned some bottles. So they were very concerned with tracking all their products. And they came to me and they said, oh, Dr. Bob, you know, we understand you can read letters and numbers on turbine blades and on wheels. Can you read letters and numbers on these labels? Uh, and the labels are high-quality labels, but they're, the printing is done, it's called demand printing. The label is already pre-printed and high-quality, but then when the product is filled, there's a printer, like an inkjet printer, that prints on demand, and that isn't as high-quality. And the labels sometimes are greasy, so the ink doesn't stick, and sometimes the, uh, there's humidity in the air, and sometimes the, 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 it gets skewed, so it's not so easy to read those numbers. Well, we can read those numbers because we had artificial intelligence technology. <clears throat> so we installed it, and we could read all the serial numbers. And then they said, well, unfortunately, we didn't realize that the people who were checking the serial numbers, because that's how it was done before, they had these uh, lines coming by and four people on each side of the line reading them, making sure they're read. They said, these same people make sure that the cap is there and that it's the correct label because sometimes they load the road along labels and sometimes a label is crooked. Can you do that? Well, until this point, uh, most of the technology was based on my doctoral thesis, which has to do with reading characters and reading barcodes. But I knew enough about technology and I knew enough about the engineers I'd hired and their capabilities that said, yeah, we can do that. So we went from just reading things to now we could measure things. We could find the edges of the label very quickly. We could inspect if the cap was there. And that grew the business quite dramatically. And that product line that does all these other things is now called Insight. And it's an easily usable product by factory technicians to set up. They don't have to know machine vision. They don't have to know mathematics. They don't have to know how to program. It's sort of like Excel where they fill in the blanks. And that product is also responsible for about $500 million of our business. So overall, machine vision has the capabilities of finding things very accurately, uh, telling a robot or a machine where it is measuring things very accurately to see if they're the correct, if, if they're the correct measurements, the angle and X, Y, and Z, and also looking at flaws on things. Are there defects? Are there scratches on things? Those are the, the capabilities that a human has in, in a human's vision. We have now put that capability into a small product, as small as a cell phone, and 
very reasonably priced. They, they, the products range from $400 to $3,000. So you've explained the product. You've explained even how you sell it in different applications that mm -hmm. you've been talking about. But you go to a couple of thousand employees from three. Mm -hmm. How did you maintain? Let's talk about the culture of the company. How did you maintain a culture that, of, of cohesiveness when you get up to thousands of employees? It's a very good question because the people who first join a company, they're different. They are not the people who want to join Hitachi or Sony or Mitsubishi or IBM uh, or, or, or other large companies. People who are drawn to a small company are drawn to it because of the collegiality. That's one thing. They'll know all the people. They're drawn to it because they know that they're going to be able to make a difference. Because if you're one out of three and you're doing work, a lot of what happens every day is your doing. And a lot of what you've invested in the product is yours, comes out of your brain. So you get people who are entrepreneurial, who generally aren't looking to make a lot of money necessarily. That's not true in all startups. Some people join startups to get rich, I suppose. But the people who joined my company joined it because they wanted to work in, in a small environment, high tech, where there were smart people uh, involved and a smart guy running things in this case, a guy that they, they, that they believed in, they believed his vision for what the company would be. And you made a lot of money doing this. And they did as well, but you made a lot of money. And you immediately, this is what captivates my imagination. You immediately turned around and say, what can I do also with the money to make things better mm -hmm. all the way around? sometimes called philanthropy, but I want to talk about that. I want to talk about your political stuff too, but let's talk about philanthropy. What is your goal there? Well, I, we will go down that path, but I wanted to uh, talk a bit more about culture. Okay, good. And the reason I started the company was not to make money. And most of the people that I know who are successful in business didn't necessarily start the business to make money. They started a business because they wanted to be in control. And that I'm a control person. Uh, I find it difficult to follow orders, to follow rules, unless they make sense. You know, I think of every law, every rule as a suggestion, right? Does this make sense? <laughs> Does it make sense, for example, to stop at a red light at four in the morning when there are no cars coming, right? Does that make sense? Now, I'll tell you, in Japan, where I was, I, I learned a lot of things about business in Japan, a lot of things about culture. I was at an intersection in Japan at three in the morning, walking home from the train station, because in Japan, as you may know, you have business meetings that go on till about eight o'clock, and then you go karaoke, dancing, eating, and, and, and drinking until three in the morning, and you go home and start again at seven. And I came to this intersection in downtown, it's called the Shinjuku section of Tokyo. On foot. On foot. And there were no cabs. So you can't take a cab from the train station. But it wasn't that far. It was maybe a 20-minute walk from the train station. Nice evening. Uh, and there were no car, no cabs. And frankly, there were no cars. And I came to an intersection. And there, of course, are lights at an intersection saying, walk, don't walk. It might have been in Japanese. But I think it was like this and like this. Whatever. You knew what the, inter what the signs meant. And as I approached this intersection, I noticed two things. One, there were no cars. And the highways were, you could see a mile. Okay, there were no cars. Second thing I noticed, there were four Japanese businessmen standing, patiently waiting for the light to change. And, and I, was, you know, I was sort of hesitant to what to do. Because here I'm in someone else's culture. Sure, and they're standing you like, there. You like to respect their culture. On the other hand, what the heck are you going to stand in line? What are you going to stand here? I mean, I, so I decided I was going to teach the Japanese a bit about being an entrepreneur. Okay? So I crossed the street. So this is just an example of what entre entrepreneurs are different from other people. And that's why people who start companies are called entrepreneurs. They have different, different ways of thinking. And that was what really was instrumental in, in my starting the company. I wanted to build a company, or I wanted to be at work. And first of all, you have to realize that most of your waking hours are going to be at work. 
You're going to spend more time at work than with your spouse, friends, girlfriend, whatever. You're going to spend more time at work during, during your waking hours. So you better like it. So I wanted to create an environment that I liked because I knew I was going to, I like work. So I want to like the work and I'm going to be there. So that meant I had to be with people who I admired, who I thought were, were, were good people that also had similar views about life. The view about life that was most important is that work is important, not just to make money, but work is the way that you add value to your day, to society. That's what work is. And at the end of the day, the week, the month, the year, you can look back and see what you accomplished. And that's the major thing about work. Yes, it pays, pays the bills. And this gets back to you know, one of the problems in our society of welfare, paying people not to work. You are depriving those people of the self-esteem of getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, dressing, and going to work and doing something that is important to the world. And important to the world doesn't just mean you know, designing a rocket ship or a cure to AIDS. Important things means delivering a meal to somebody at a table that you're waiting on in the right order and, and you remembered the order and you got it right and, and, and made that meal enjoyable. So all work is valuable, but welfare takes away that potential to feel good about yourself and to add meaning to your life. So I always, getting back to how I grew, I was involved in hiring people. That's the most important thing a CEO can do. Now, you can't, a CEO certainly can't interview every person once the company is beyond 200 people or you're hiring 100 people a year. You can't interview them all. But you can damn sure, make sure, that the people who are in charge of hiring know exactly what to look for. And what we looked for at Cognex was enthusiasm, a generally positive attitude, uh, of course, the technical ability to do the job, whether the job was cleaning up the place or whether the job was uh, uh, soldering connectors or the job was software or managing the books, that, that is easy to test for. Attitude is what is so much more important. And if I had to hire for attitude or aptitude, I would hire for attitude. You can teach skills, but you can't teach attitude. So with that attitude, we were able to build a company that has a fantastic culture, one that I'm not just saying is fantastic, the investors around the world, the fund analysts talk about the wonderful culture that we have. And the culture is summarized, Roger, by a number of statements that we have. Uh, I talked about the 10 core values, which we, which we have uh, uh, artistically portrayed on various walls in the company, and, and we give each employee a, a nice uh, uh, lex um, uh, plastic plaque that has uh, little cartoons on it and descriptions of the 10 values. So we're always talking about the values, and I'll, I'll just give you some of the main ones. The company's motto is, work hard, play hard, move fast. Right? And work comes first. You can't play until you've worked hard. And moving fast is important because even though you might be doing the right thing, if you're doing it too slowly, you're not going to be successful. So I added that later on in the years. It used to be work hard, play hard, and then I added move fast. There are many other statements that summarize the culture of the company. And we have so many that I actually put out a book, uh, a booklet, and it's called Quotes from Chairman Bob. Now, it's a yellow book. Now, this is a takeoff of Mao Zedong's uh, little red book that had quotes from Mao Zedong. So I'm going to read you some of these quotes that uh, most of them are mine, but some of them I just might like, and I copy them from other people. But these are the kinds of things that we find important in the company and we stress in the company, and we give Awards based on these things. The 10 values, every time we give an award, a president's award, we say uh, Sarah Smith is getting this award because she excelled at this or she persevered at that. And so we always try to emphasize these things to keep the culture alive. So here are some other ones. When Cognex wins, we all win. And this, you know, that's not true in most companies, okay? In most companies, when the company does great, the executives do great, right? Now, 
companies may have bonus plans and everything, but we really mean this. And in our company, if we fail to meet the bonus goals, no one gets a bonus, including the executives. Another thing about the company, equity, fairness. We don't provide cars. We don't provide any special benefits to executives, not one. What we provide is more salary, more stock options, because they're harder to find and you have to go market rate. But no one gets a, a car. No one gets any kinds of special bennies uh, because of that. Here's one that's rare. You'll never hear this before. Don't do what you're told. Do what's right. This, and I emphasize this at company meetings, or I did when I was CEO, and whenever I got the chance, I would give this award, and the award is a $100 bill framed uh, with, my, with my signature saying, you did what's right. And I would give a short speech to the employees at an employee meeting about how Pat Alias did something that I told him not to do. He came up with an idea to visit a customer, and I said, that's a waste of time. Don't do it. Now, normally when the CEO says don't do it, you don't do it. Not a Cognix, because we have a rule. Don't do what you're told. Do what's right. But you better be right, more often than not. Okay, yeah, we can tolerate with errors, right? We like that. But we hire people for their brains, not for their muscle. This isn't a construction site or, you know, or where, where muscle matters more than other things. This is a company where intellect matters. So we're hiring smart people. So when I say don't do what you're told, do what's right, I figure you're going to do what's right. But you have an obligation to push back on your boss to argue. All right? No, what other company tells you to argue? You think in the U.S. military, uh, which we're going to hear some stories about, not in this episode, you think they, uh, you think they would tolerate don't, doing, what, doing what you want, doing what, what's right rather than what you're told? Impossible. Another one is good is not good enough. Excellence is expected. Now, that's not to say that we always get excellence. That's not the case. But we don't want to settle for good. We don't settle. Because if you settle, if, if when, and I tell people, you're going to be a manager someday, and I want you to understand that you have to hire the best possible people even better than you. Because what happens in a company, very often, the guy here or the woman here has high standards. And occasionally, oh, we need to fill that role they'll lower the stand. They'll, they'll lower from an A to a B. Well, pretty soon the company grows. This B person is now in a position to hire. And that person is going to say, well, I, we really got to fill the role. Uh, it, it doesn't quite meet my standards, but it will go pretty soon the company's average, mediocre. So it's incredibly important to have these values and to set expectations high. Here's a good one. We take our work seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. This is so unique in companies. Typically, when companies get successful or when you have people on high salaries, they think they know it all, and they act differently. They're arrogant. They're pompous. They don't want to listen to other people because they've made it to the top, and that means they know everything. Well, that's not true at Cognex. Not true in life. It's, it's not true in life. That's right. But, it's, but that's the way people often they act. Are. But we don't accept that at Cognex. We take our work seriously, but not ourselves. And people have described me. <laughs> One employee says, well, let me, let me, let me summarize who Bar Dr. Bob is. He's 50% Mel Brooks, which is a, com a comedian from 30 years ago, and 50% Albert Einstein. And I think I, I take both as a, as, as a real comp, a huge compliment. That is. And this is why, like on Halloween, we all dress up in crazy costumes. I could be the mad vision scientist. I could be top dog dressed like a hot dog. I could be the big cheese in a big block of cheese. And I do it for, for a number of reasons. One, it's fun to act like a kid. You don't want to grow up. You, you don't want to grow up. Act like a kid, okay? If you can get away with it. You got to work at a place where you can get away with it. So it's fun to occasionally act like a kid. The second reason is that when employees see me after Halloween, they'll say, I can walk up to that guy. He was, he was just a he hot dog. Yeah, he, he, was the, he was the cheese or the <laughs> top cog or something like that. So it helps 
people relate, and therefore you're going to hear more stories. If all an executive does is listen to his direct reports, he's not going to, he's going to get a filter because from the time a story starts here to the time it gets here, it changes its dimensions uh, dramatically. Okay, so, uh, and I've always felt it's worth listening to people and associating with people who are smarter or older than you. Uh, older because old is wisdom. It's, there's, a, there's a degree of knowledge that you can't get from books, but you can get from either living life or talking to people who have lived a little bit more than you. So uh, Experiencing. E- experience. And, you know, there's a saying, a smart man, I'll say man, a smart man learns from his own mistakes. A smarter man learn from someone else's mistakes. Absolutely. So if you associate with people who are smart and accomplished and a little older than you, you're going to learn a hell of a lot. I'm so, I'm so glad you elaborated on this culture thing because that was a phenomenal explanation of a very different kind of company that I think most people work in uh, in their lives. And I think they're now saying to them, so why don't I work for a company like that? You know, We have openings. So we have openings. Now, the qu- the, the challenge becomes... Once the company grows and you have many offices, right. how do you establish or how do you maintain that same successful culture around the world? In Japan, a different culture. In China, in Thailand, in India. How do you maintain? First of all, the fact that there are different cultures, the kinds of things we do um, apply to all of them. You know, this has nothing to do with Shintoism, Buddhism, or there's no religion in here. It applies to all of them. So the fact that they come from different um, uh, historical cultures doesn't mean they can't adopt a cognex culture on top of their ethnic culture. I want to make that clear. But still, the question is, the challenge was, and I re- realized this maybe 10 years ago, I said, hmm, the culture here in Natick, in headquarters, we have 400 people, it's great. But I can't visit every office. I can't stimulate people. I can't walk around and talk to people in every office and say, you know, that chair doesn't look comfortable. Let me get you a new one. And I do that. And I want all my managers to do it. They don't, but I think they should, right? They should walk around all the time. So I can't do that. So I decided, ah, I'm going to appoint myself as chief culture officer. And I came up with that term far before you've seen it on the internet. And... To help me around the world, I'm going to find cognoids, that's the name for our our employees, who volunteer to be ministers of culture in each office. So in each office of more than 20 or 30 people, uh, uh, we have a process where people can nominate themselves or nominate someone else to be a minister of culture. And what that means is they are going to be trained very carefully in Cognex culture. We have a culture camp one week every year where all these ministers come to Cognex, we have about 15 or 20 of them, for training, detailed training about how to run parties, how to keep track of expenses, uh, what are good ideas uh, from the past, what kind of parties were good, what kind of events were not good. Their job is to make Cognex a fun place, an enjoyable place to work. And that's work. To make something enjoyable is itself work, we pay extra, and it's a separate check. We don't include it in their regular check. We want them to know that we appreciate what you're doing and that this is a job. Everybody else is going to have fun. You're going to be worried. <laughs> so that's so, how we maintain the And that's worked, hasn't it? It worked beautifully, yeah. beautifully around the world. And we also have a facilities manager who is extremely competent, and he put together, uh, he, he was the first of our facilities managers to do this, he put together a guidebook about what the office is supposed to look like with photographs, with vendors, with product names and numbers, with the, with the number of the kind of paint, the color paint, what the PMA, PMX, or whatever number it's supposed to be, so that all the offices feel and look like Cognex. That is an incredible description of all of that. But let's get back to Dr. Bob. So Dr. Bob's a cultural chief culture officer yep. of Cognex, but you're also getting into other spheres. And I want to talk about this for a while because you've made an impact in philanthropy and you've made an impact in politics. Talk about the philanthropy and making the world a better place. Well, you know, there are, there are a lot of people on earth, right? And they fall into various categories. 
there are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who say, what's happening? Who don't know even what's happening. Uh, everybody is one of those three, right? And I, fortunately, was born to be one of the people who make things happen. And one of the things that I enjoy making happen is brightening people's day. This is way before philanthropy. Brightening people's day. Saying good morning with a smile, you know, telling a joke, telling somebody that, gee, that's a, that's a gorgeous blouse. I'm not sure you can say that these days. You Completely forbidden careful. today, yeah, sorry. Forbidden, yeah, forbidden, <laughs> uh, yeah. Only if it's a man who's wearing the blouse, then you can say it properly. <laughs> you can say then it. it's okay. So just doing something nice. And I'm going to tell you a couple stories. You know, you, you can be nice and make an impact on people's days without being a, a wealthy philanthropist. Simple things. Like going into the men's room. And who hasn't gone to the men's room and seen towels all over the floor? Now, the towels are all over the floor, the paper towels, because the bin is full. Now, the bin appears full, but it's not full. It's just because nobody's pushed it down. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Right? right. So when before I leave the men's room, I pick up the towels, and I put them in there, and I push it down for the next guy. So the next person enters and leaves a bathroom that looks better, right? A simple thing, right? Of course, you wash your hands, you know, don't, you're not going to catch anything, don't worry. So that's a simple thing. But there are more, there, there are other things you can do. When you're in traffic, you can let somebody in. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get there that much later if you let somebody in who's trying to get into traffic. But I know a guy in Boston, I won't give his name, who I used to be sort of friends with because he, he was a lawyer, the wrong kind of lawyer, by the way. He was a litigator, right? Product litigator, wrong kind. I think there's far too much litigation in the world. But he had good stories and he seemed okay. Then one day he picked me up at my house. We were going to a restaurant and he picked me up. And we came to an intersection and he cut a guy off. I said, why did you cut that guy off? He says, just for the fuck of it. I wanted to, right? That's a litigator for you, right? Litigators do not spread happiness. They spread anger, discontent, and expense. It, you know, hold, I can go into lots of details on certain professions that are lousy. You know, you want somebody nice? A nurse. Nurses are nice. They want to take care of people, okay? Litigators want to hurt people, want to harm people, you know, money-wise, hopefully. Okay, but there are some other very interesting stories in my past that I'll tell about. One is when the company went public or was getting ready to go public, you hire these investment bankers who uh, take you on what's called a road show. And a road show is a place where yeah, you go on the road and, and they fly you, sometimes private jets, you know, sometimes commercial, but you're always picked up by limousines because time is important. You have a million meetings. And who are you meeting with? You're meeting with managers of large pension funds, large investment funds. It, it might be one of Fidelity's funds or, or God forbid, BlackRock funds. Or, or <laughs> It's another story. Experience uh, yeah, speaking yeah, or, there. Or TIA, Kraft. There are lots of... Everybody knows about stocks and mutual funds. Mutual funds buy stocks, and they often invest in startups. So the goal of the roadshow is to explain your company to these people so they'll be very interested in buying the stock because you're trying to raise money. So this is the company's uh, initial public offering. And uh, we hired a banker and uh, about three people from the company, myself, maybe a, a marketing guy and also the chief financial officer, go and we're all dressed in suits and attache cases. That's the way it was in the 80s. Um, and, and the bankers, there are probably five bankers uh, who, uh, who introduce you to, to these fund managers and give a brief pitch and then it's up to me to talk about the company, give a slideshow. Well, it was early in the morning. We had just landed, and I'm starving. I said, we gotta, we got to get breakfast. Is there time? Yeah, the first meeting's at 8.15. It's 7.30 now. Yeah. So we're in the middle of, I think it was Nebraska, in the middle of this flat part of the world, and you're driving through cornfields, and the driver knew that there was a, a, uh, uh, a diner up the road somewhere. So we pull into this diner, and 
lots of things, lots of trucks in the diner, dusty old trucks and stuff from farmers, of course, having breakfast. And as we pulled in, these, these stretch limousines raised dust, and I could see in the window people looking out. What's that? You know, I don't know if they- <laughs> Guys in suits. <laughs> guys in suits in the middle of the summer or whatever, and they've never seen stretch limousines in, the, in, in, this part of the, in that part of the country. <clears throat> so we go in, and we get seated, and this waiter comes over, and he was, he was a kid, at most, 18, 19 years old, Still had uh, had uh, all the acne of you that 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 many boys do at that age, and he came over, hesitant, you know, to, to these high powered, seemingly high powered people, and he took the orders, and he served us, and everything that we ordered was right. Now, I don't know how many times you've been to a restaurant where many times it doesn't come back right, right, right? or they give it to the wrong. This guy did everything right. I, we were really busy. They're raring to go, Dr. Bob, let's go. And they picked up the check, and I called the kid over, and I said, listen, I want you to know that I noticed how carefully you wrote it down and how, how you delivered each plate properly to the right person. There are eight people here. Didn't make a mistake. You cleaned up, and the bill was right. I want to tell you that if you continue life taking care of customers the way you did today, you're going to be very successful. And I gave him a $100 bill. $100 bill. And that well, was then. Yeah, that even was $100, even $100 tip now. Yeah. And, and the tip was already covered. Somebody else picked up the whole bill. I gave him the $100 bill. He looked at me, he looked at the bill, and he said, he didn't take it. He said, this is a joke, right? <laughs> That's the kind of upbringing he had. Sure. He didn't expect anything special for doing the job right that's part that was his job he did his job right and if you say thank you he'd appreciate that that's he it. did not expect a hundred dollars but he took the hunt i insisted he took it and i saw him go into the kitchen glass glass there was glass there and he was showing it to people pointing it to me now he is going to remember that experience for life right so for a hundred dollars I think I made a major impact on someone's life. There you go. And it shouldn't just be me. Every He's got a one... string of diners now across Nebraska. <laughs> That's, I wish. I wish. Yeah. And everyone can do things like that. You, you can, can over tip. Now, most people, you know, only express when they're not happy. They don't express when they are happy. And I do both. I usually, if, I, if I'm unhappy with the service, I won't tell the server. I'll tell the manager because the manager wants to know. But if I'm happy with the service, I tell the server. Sure, sure. Another well, example about how you can change people's lives without having to be a millionaire. For a while, I was living in a dormitory, in a, a school dormitory called the Berkeley School of Music. It's not Berkeley, California. It's Berkeley. Right. And it's in Massachusetts. It's a well-known jazz school. Wonderful school. <clears throat> and they had a dormitory uh, in a rough part of Boston, it turns out. And there were about six floors. The first two floors were a cafeteria, uh, and above that were uh, uh, practice rooms, so pr people could practice their instruments. And the f top four floors were dorms. Small rooms, two kids in each dorm, and these are teenagers. So to make sure that the dorm, that people weren't going overly crazy, every floor had an adult living there. And I was a professor at the time, and I applied, and I got the job to be a dorm manager. Now, the, the, because it was a rough neighborhood, they had a guard, even then, at the elevator. So if you wanted to go into the dorm, you had to show your ID to get, to get into the dorm, to, you know, to keep criminals out, uh, petty thefts, whatever, any kind of criminal. And that worked pretty well. And, you know, the, uh, these uh, uh, the security guards don't get paid much. And there's usually a rotation of security guards, not the same guy usually. But I found this one guy, his name was John. And, uh, and he was more neatly dressed than the rest. His hair was always correct. And his mannerism was better than the rest. And I started talking to him in just a small conversations because you're just waiting for the elevator. How long does it take for four floors, right? Not that long. But after a week or so of talking to him, I looked at him and I said, 
you know, John, you can do more with your life than being a security guard. That's all I said. And, you know, I kept on living my life. He lived his life. I occasionally saw him, whatever. Then he disappeared, and they rotate. Five years later, I got a letter on company letterhead saying John DeDoming, forensic accountants. And in that letter, he said, Dear Mr. Shulman, you may not remember me, and he related the story. And he said, I now, uh, I started, I went back to business school, I went back to college, I got a degree in accounting, I worked for a while, then I got, uh, then I started my own firm, and I want you to know, the words that you said to me, those few words of encouragement, you were the only person who ever said to me, you can do better. Right? Life lessons. Life lessons. Treat people nicely. Say something nicely, and maybe you can make a change in their life, and that helps make the world a better place. It's so interesting that you started with this personal approach rather right. than talking about the mega philanthropy mm -hmm. that I know you've been involved in or the uh, other mega things, but one-on-one -on -one makes sometimes the biggest difference. And frankly, <clears throat> I've been giving money away for a long time now, um, I tell people my PhD no longer stands for Doctor of Philosophy, it stands for Doctor of Philanthropy. Uh, and I give money to organizations. But it's not nearly as satisfying to finding special people and helping them with their life. It's not nearly as satisfying, but I, I still do it. It's, it's, it's a responsibility. And it, you've also had a lot of involvement on the political level. And I, you know, I, I want you to talk about this. I know sometimes people are reluctant to talk about mm -hmm. politics, but you, because of your background and the way you came up with this company and the kind of values you've expressed today in this interview, you have very strong feelings about politics. Well, I have strong feelings about freedom. Yes. And that got me involved in politics. When I think every day, about how blessed I have been uh, to be where I am, to have succeeded as I have. Coming from a very moderate background, in a prior episode we talk about uh, uh, my father and my mother and sister and whatever, and the family we had was poor, rather poor, right? As I mentioned, we had one bottle of soda a week. My father never had a new car, and occasionally he didn't have any kind of car. So. To, to realize that that is possible in our society is, it's just magnificent to understand that that can occur without anyone else's help, right? You know, Barack Obama said, you have a company, you didn't build that. Well, I don't know what, who the fuck did then if I didn't build it, right? I don't know what he's talking about. He, he has no idea because he's never talked to an entrepreneur, he's never been to an entrepreneur, he never had a job. Never built anything. Never built anything. You didn't build that. That's what he actually said. I know. Right? Very insulting. Now, of course, I, you know, I, I, I made use of the roads, uh, but everybody makes use of the roads. I made use of whatever was available, but the government didn't help me. And, and in any way, the government didn't help me. Generally, the government gets in the way of business. So when I realized how important the free market system is, which is another name for capitalism, when I realized how, how many people have been lifted from poverty, then I said, I have to get involved in helping to support those politicians who believe in America, who love America. And that's when I, I, you know, I made contacts and my name uh, got circulated. Of course, once you give money to, to, to a party, you're on the list. You're on the list. You get lots of opportunities to do more. <laughs> But I, all, but I still view it as an opportunity to do good, okay? So when people ask me, when organizations or politicians come to me and ask me for donations, I'm, I don't get upset. I'm, I don't always say yes. Um, but I'm not upset because it's an, they're giving me the opportunity to do something good. If you were to summarize, and we've talked a lot now uh, about your life, about Cognex, about your personal philosophy. If you were to summarize your life lessons of all of that, looking back over those years and all the experiences, now that you're an older person with a lot of experience, 
let's have that benefit of wisdom for the people who are watching this. First thing people have to uh, strive to do <clears throat> is be positive, right? It's in our society, especially today, we're told about how many bad things there are. This is bad, that's bad, white's bad, gray's bad, male is bad. Just stop listening to that kind of news. Matter of fact, it affected me, was affecting me, that I turned in my cable box about six months ago. I said... You're not the only one. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> I don't know if the news, what they're telling me is true or not anymore. You don't know anymore. It used to be more often than not true, right? Although... I think it was Will Rogers who said, if you don't read the paper, that was the only means then, if you don't read the paper, you're uninformed. And if you do, you're misinformed. So maybe it was always true. That was 100 years ago he said that too. Right. <laughs> and maybe it was always true yeah. <clears throat> that you didn't know if what you read was right or wrong. But lately, you really don't know. And then I realized everything on the news was negative. Now, that's not true in foreign countries. I've been to foreign countries. They report on business news, lots and lots of news. Here, it's always negative, which puts you in a bad mood. So one of the life's lessons I've learned is wake up every day and try to be positive about, about life. The fact that you awaken, the fact that you can breathe air, clean air, the fact that you, in most places, you can drink water out of the tap. It's another thing. I don't know why people buy bottled water. I mean, you know, water is best to live through a pipe, not by you going to a, 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 a store and, and, and lugging back plastic containers of water. That it just doesn't. Which are filled from a pipe. Which are filled, ultimately <laughs> filled from a pipe. <laughs> right. I never, I just don't get it, but. I have lots of friends who pay for water. I, I don't get it. So think positively. Get an education. Now, that doesn't mean college. Matter of fact, although I was a college professor, right, I told my kids, each one, when they graduated high school or when they were ready to graduate, getting ready, you don't have to go to college. I don't have an expectation that you're going to get an advanced degree. It doesn't bother me. I will give you the same amount of money that college education will cost, which is somewhere around a quarter of a million dollars. I will give you that money as long as you do something useful with it. Start a business, start a career. College is a waste of time for most people. And matter of fact, if you look at the wealthiest people in the world, the ones that I know of, Bill Gates never got a degree. Dropped out. Dropped out. Michael Dell from Dell Computer, dropped out. Right, Steve Jobs, I think, took a couple courses at Reed, dropped out. I don't know about uh, Zuckerberg. I think he didn't finish, dropped out. So now I'm not saying college education is wrong for everyone. Certainly, if you're going to be a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, there are certain key things that you're going to have to learn. But college is a sham, even for those things, because they load it up with the general curriculum. All right? They want you to pay for four years when you, they could have taught you everything you need for that profession or for that, uh, for that uh, to go on in life in two years. So it's an utter sham, highly overpriced. It's gone up much faster than even the cost of health care, which is way faster than the cost of living. So, but, so when I say get an education, I mean that. Get a job somewhere. Work as an intern. Work, work alongside a carpenter. You, You'll get educated in something that's useful and that you'll be able to make a, make a living in. Enthusiasm. Again, that goes with, with, with positive attitude. Try to be the best. Don't join a union. Unions don't want you to show off. Matter of fact, I have stories of people who've joined, joined a union and they were told, hey, slow down. You're making the rest of us look bad. Right. Instead of saying, hey, this guy really knows what he's doing. Let's see if we can copy him. No, that's not what unions do. They want everybody to be mediocre. Nobody should stand up to, to offend the others. And this is happening with uh, critical race theory. It's happening in college now, where professors are told to grade minority papers more leniently. True stories. To give them higher grade than what they would normally get so you don't hurt their feelings. 
how are their feelings going to be when they graduate and can't design an engine for a car or can't cook uh, the right kind of quiche? How are they going to feel? They're going to feel cheated. They were cheated out of an education by being passed along even though they didn't yet qualify. Which is really racism. Total racism. Total racism. And how do you think the people who work hard for the grade feel toward those who are getting the grade for free? It exacerbates anger between the races between classes. This is not what America was built, was designed to be. So, Dr. Bob, I mean, as a result of this fabulous business that you started and grew into an international success, you've made a lot of money. What does that mean to you? Okay, first of all, it is true that I've made a lot of money because uh, I invested uh, my life savings into stock of a company, and that stock has gone from when we went public. Well, when we started the company, the company was worth $86,000, which Your is money. exactly what I put into it. Yes. Today, it's worth $14 billion in real money. So people have stock, and if you add up, multiply the shares times the $80 per share, you get $14 billion. Now, of course, I don't own all the company anymore. I've sold off pieces over time at much lower prices. Uh, but in addition to myself making a lot of money because of the free market system, all of my employees, and I'm saying all of my employees, have participated in that growth. Not because, just because of salary and bonuses, but we gave all of my employees in the first 20 years stock options, and those options became worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and oftentimes tens of millions of dollars. So the free enterprise system, which is capitalism, allowed this to happen, and it's not as if that money came from other people. It's not... It wasn't taken away. When somebody makes a million dollars in the stock market, it doesn't mean that somebody lost a million dollars. It doesn't mean that. And making money is extremely important. Now, I'm, I want to talk about this because today the politics of the left are that if you make money, you must have stolen it or earned it over someone else's labor. Um, somehow it was unethical that you made money. And I want to counter that, making money is a, a representation of the value that you gave society. You didn't take anything from society. I'm going to give you a simple example. When I was a kid, I mowed lawns and I shoveled snow from people's driveways to make money. Now, what happened? I gave my labor two hours or three hours of shoveling or, or cutting the lawn for pieces of paper or ones and zeros in a bank account. Those ones or zeros represented exactly the value of what I did, because otherwise they wouldn't have paid me that, that amount. So when an individual devotes his service to doing something, whether it's an accountant filling out your tax forms, or whether it's a, a machinist who's machining something for you, or building a car and selling you a car, the amount of money he or she receives is a direct representation of what he gave. Not what he took, it's what he gave to society. Right? So an income tax, which is a tax on the money you make, is the worst kind of tax. It's taxing you for giving. Now, it's clearly society needs to raise money to pay for the roads and the military, whatever. The better tax is a tax, a sales tax, a tax on when you take something. You, you buy a plane, you buy a house, you buy a cell phone. That is a more legitimate tax. An income tax is a disincentive to making money. And I've, every time I gave talk to my employees, I talk about how the fact we are very profitable. Now, most people these days would... would would say, oh, it's wrong to be profitable. And I explained to them that the fact that we're so profitable is a measure of the quality of our product and the intellectual uh, technology that's inside. We don't put a gun to somebody's head. You must pay $3,000 for a data man. They, willing, they order it. 
here's, here's the ones and zeros. Here's the pieces of paper. Give us a data map. And the fact that we're more profitable on a percentage basis than most other American companies gives me pride. It means that my company, my employees, are very special in that they have ba they're able to create this kind of value. Anybody can run a business to lose money or to break even. That means, that means you didn't devote much. You didn't do much for society. So making money is serious. Now, there's also a criticism people have too much money. Well, first of all, when they die, they don't take it to Mars. It doesn't go to heaven or hell, wherever they end up, right? Here's what happens to the money that people have. Yes, you could argue that $50 billion is far more than somebody should have. No, you could argue that, but it doesn't matter. They die. Uh, no one gets out alive. And it turns out the U.S. government, the federal tax on estates, on money you leave behind, is 40%. So you should want people to get $50 billion, because that means when they die, 40% of 50 is $20 billion is going to go into the, into the treasury of the United States. Also, you should want people who are living to make money because they pay 30, 40, 50% in taxes. Who do you think pays for the roads and, and for the welfare and for the health care and for the education? It's the people who make money. And the more money they make, the more they pay. So this is why I'm involved to a certain degree in politics. I'm not running for office, but certainly I am involved in helping good people, those people who love America, who love the experience that, who want to recreate the experience that I've had to make it possible for other people to go through that experience. Dr. Bob, thanks so much. That was uh, part three of our series of uh, interviews, Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. He's going to come back with interviewing other people to get their stories and their life lessons. But we appreciate your joining us for this three-part series, Dr. Bob, Life Lessons Learned. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoy these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time.